Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Side Hustle Club podcast. Today's episode is inspired by several recent conversations I was having with clients about how they're kind of a tiny bit concerned that their content is getting low engagement. And because of that, they're also kind of a tiny bit concerned that things aren't working and hence that they need to do more things or try something else. And I have a lot to say about this topic. And this episode, it's going to get a bit technical, but ultimately my goal for today's conversation is to offer a different perspective and help you view your engagement and metrics in a more helpful light. And before we dive in, I want to invite you to come join us inside our first ever cohort of the Thought Leader Club, which is starting on November 1st, 2023. So inside the Thought Leader Club, you will become a thought leader both internally and externally because learning to build a body of work that not only lets you become known for something, but also magnetizes opportunities and clients to you, it is undoubtedly one of the most powerful and important skills that you can learn in your lifetime as an entrepreneur. And here's the thing, maybe one of your three-year dreams is to create speaking opportunities, or maybe one of your dreams is to create a group coaching program that attracts best fit clients from all over the world. Or maybe you really want to have a really popular podcast where you bring on amazing guests who are genuinely honored to be on your show. Or maybe you want to build community and host in-person events. So whatever your dreams are for the long term, the common thread that underlies all of your big audacious dreams is that you can actually start laying down the foundation for each of them step by step right now. And how exactly can you do this? You can do so by starting to build a body of work that lets you become known for your unique thought leadership, your story, and how amazing you are at what you do. And this is precisely what we will do inside the Thought Leader Club. And for those who join us before October 10th, you'll also get access to an early bird bonus, which is our signature course, The Podcast Club. And inside The Podcast Club, you are going to learn, number one, how to hone in on your unique thought leadership and build brand awareness for it through your podcast. Number two, learning how to leverage your podcast to sign clients for your high ticket offers or services. And number three, how to consistently create a weekly podcast episode on two to four hours a week all by yourself and without overwhelm. And this early bird bonus is going to beautifully complement everything that you work on and create inside the Thought Leader Club. So do join us before October 10 if you also want access to the podcast club in addition to joining us inside the Thought Leader Club. And again, our first ever cohort is starting on November 1st. And for the details of the program, you can hop on over to CherylTheory.com slash program. And this is also where you can submit your application to join the next round and book a discovery call for us to chat further about how exactly this program can support your 2023 and 2024 goals and also how exactly building a body of work and becoming known for your unique thought leadership fits into your three-year vision and goals. Okay, so now as we segue into the conversation for today, I want to first start by acknowledging that there is a lot of dialogue in the online space about how you need an engaged audience. And there's a lot of advice about how to get more likes or how to go viral on LinkedIn and so on. And logically, it makes sense because in our brains, more numbers equals more chances of something working, right? But I think first and foremost, it is important to recognize that likes don't equal clients and comments don't equal clients or opportunities, right? Followers don't equal clients or opportunities. Clients and opportunities actually are like the actual indicators of a client or opportunity, right? So for example, like I myself have a very quiet audience and someone would say that I have low engagement, for example, on Instagram. But Honestly, this has not been a hindrance to me growing my business and brand. And for transparency, right now, my Instagram story views typically range from 60 to 100 views a day. And I don't typically get more than like 20 to 30 views, or sorry, not views, likes per Instagram post. And my recent podcast episodes typically get less than 150 listens in the first few months of the episode being released. So overall, my numbers aren't 
they're not like astonishing. They're pretty average to most people. But that being said, some people who might have similar numbers or analytics as myself will think that these are awful numbers, but someone might look at the same numbers and don't think it is an issue whatsoever. Meaning that different individuals can look at the same cold hard numbers and can have completely different interpretations of it. Speaking of which, I want to share a personal life example of this. So my cat, Nugget, started to kind of like limp about two months ago. And at first, I thought maybe she just sprained it. Maybe she just jumped too far from like the the cat tree to the sofa and maybe she just sprained her leg. But after a few weeks, I could see that her hind legs simply were not getting better. So I brought her to a vet and the vet did an x-ray and interpreted the x-ray results as there being a hairline fracture. So the vet then prescribed me some pain-killing medications for Nugget and said that her fracture should heal within a few weeks. But then a few weeks have passed and honestly, I did not see any improvement. Like she's still dragging her back legs and she's still struggling to jump on the sofa and she does not even use the cat tree anymore because she literally cannot jump anymore, right? So just a few days ago, I actually brought Nugget to a second vet to seek another opinion. And when this second vet looked at the original x-ray scan from the first vet, he said that he honestly doesn't think that the original x-ray showed any signs of a fracture, which was shocking to me because the first vet was very confident that the scan showed that there there was a fracture. Well, the the second vet then did further x-rays just to double check. And based on this new set of x-ray, it doesn't seem like there was a fracture whatsoever. So at the moment, Nugget is going to be referred to a specialist and we're going to figure out why she's limping and dragging her legs and also just tipping over whenever she's walking. But the point I want to highlight here is that even with cold hard data, like an x-ray, there can still be different interpretations. And that's the case with social media analytics as well. It is no different, right? Because what often happens is that People will look at their analytics and immediately think that something is wrong with their content or marketing or messaging, right? Especially when in their eyes, like people aren't liking their posts. But do remember also that likes and comments don't have a correlation with whether someone is thinking of working working with you or whether or not they actually want to work with you, right? So For this episode, we're going to dive into more specific reasons why this is the case. And then I want to wrap up the conversation by discussing what might actually be more helpful indicators of your progress. Okay, so my hope is that by the end of the episode, you won't be as shaken up whenever you look at your analytics and that you'll leave this episode with another set of tools that you can use to think more about what is working and what isn't working. But first, let's have a quick lesson on data. Okay, so I know that a lot of people think that they're being analytical and strategic by looking at their data, right? But honestly, number one, we don't have enough good quality data to even draw proper conclusions from your, let's say, Instagram analytics. And number two, so many people are trying to interpret their their data, their social media analytics without fully understanding data analysis and like how to accurately interpret such information. Okay, so regarding point number one, honestly, for most of us, in my humble opinion, I think for a lot of us as solopreneurs building our businesses and brands using things like Instagram or like email, podcasting, etc., we don't have a quality data set to know if something is statistically significant or not, okay? So to start, I want to explain sample size, right? And I'm going to ex- I'm going to share a passage actually from a, a website. So the website I'm going to be citing is www.qualtrics.com slash au slash experience dash management slash research slash determine dash sample dash size. Okay, so I'm going to read out a passage from this website. When you survey a large population of respondents, you're interested in the entire group, 
but it's not realistically possible to get answers or results from absolutely everyone. So you take a random sample of individuals, which represents the population as a whole. The size of the sample is very important for getting accurate, statistically significant results and running your study successfully. If your sample is too small, you may include a disproportionate number of individuals, which are outliers and anomalies, and these skew the results and you don't get a fair picture of the whole population. Okay, so that was the passage I wanted to read out. So I want to uh, make a quick note here and say that, so let's say if you're going to look at your Instagram analytics you first need to make sure whether you even have a large enough audience size, aka your sample size, right? But before you can calculate what sample size you actually need, there are a few things that you need to know about the, the, the target population and the level of accuracy that you need. And one of the most important variables that you need to consider is population size, okay? So I'm going to uh, read out another passage from the website. How many people are you talking about in total? To find this out, you need to be clear about who does and who doesn't fit into your group. For example, if you want to know about dog owners, you'll include everyone who has at some point owned at least one dog. You may include or exclude those who owned a dog in the past, depending on your research goals. Don't worry if you can't calculate the exact number. It is common to have an unknown or an estimated range. Okay, so that was the passage. So, just as a math example, okay, so let's say in this entire globe across the whole world, there are, let's just say, 100,000 total human beings who match the profile of your ideal client, okay? So in that case, in order to have a confidence level of 95% and a margin of error, of 5%, which are the, the standards, the, the industry standards, let's just say, okay? You need to have an audience of 383 people, right? So your, your audience needs to be 383 people, which doesn't sound like a lot, but here's the, the caveat. The 383 people must actually be the profile of your ideal clients, right? Because I know that for some of you, 383 like followers on Instagram doesn't seem like that big of a number. Maybe some of you or a lot of you have a lot more than that number of followers. But remember, those 383 people must be ideal clients. And that's where most of us miss the mark. Because even if we have like 500 people following us or 1,000 people on Instagram following us, it is more often than not the case that the majority of those 1,000 people will never become a paying client. So it's then questionable whether they're even an ideal client in the first place, right? So in a nutshell, you need a sufficiently large sample size of data in order to be able to draw accurate and helpful conclusions from the data. and you need this sample slash audience to be actually representative of the population that you want to reach. So this means that ideally you would have a large enough audience filled with ideal clients so that you can actually then look at your analytics from Instagram or LinkedIn and then actually make more accurate conclusions from those numbers. And sure, like for some large organizations like governments or other like uh, maybe um, large companies who have access to like large data sets, like maybe they have access to quality data sets. But for us as solopreneurs, I would personally argue it's just not the case. Next, I want to have a discussion about data reliability and data validity. And to help me do this, I'm going to cite several paragraphs from another website. So the website I'm going to be referencing is statisticsbyjim.com slash basics slash reliability dash versus dash validity. And I'll, I'll, I'll cite all these links uh, in the show notes for this episode. Okay, so how we're gonna do this is I'm once again gonna read some passages from this website and then I'll share my translation of what it means uh, as best I can in layman terms. Okay, so first the passage. For data to be good enough to allow you to draw meaningful conclusions from a research study, they must be reliable and valid. What are the properties of good measurements? 
In a nutshell, reliability relates to the consistency of measures and validity addresses whether the measurements are quantifying the correct attribute. Reliability refers to the consistency of the measure. High reliability indicates that the measurement system produces similar results under the same conditions. If you measure the same item or person multiple times, you want to obtain comparable values. They are reproducible. If you take measurements multiple times and obtain very different values, your data are unreliable. Numbers are meaningless if repeated measures do not produce similar values. What's the correct value? No one knows. This inconsistency hampers your ability to draw conclusions and understand relationships. So suppose you have a bathroom scale that displays inconsistent results from one time to the next. It is very unreliable and it will be hard to use the scale to determine your correct weight and to know whether or not you are losing weight. Okay, so let me insert my translation here. So here's an example. Let's say you post a, a post on Monday morning. And then two days later, you post the exact same thing on Wednesday afternoon. Will you expect to get roughly the same results, like the likes, comments, impressions, reach, etc.? Likely no. And it's because of so many possible reasons. Maybe some people didn't even check their phone on Monday. Or maybe they saw it on Monday and didn't bother to like it on Wednesday. Or maybe they didn't bother to like it on, on Monday, but now they saw it again and they're like, I'm oh, actually kind of like this post. Let me like it, right? So that example alone already shows that your social media analytics can be, like the measurements of it could be arguably inconsistent. Okay, so let me read out another paragraph here. Inadequate data collection procedures and low quality or defective data collection tools can produce unreliable data. Additionally, some characteristics are more challenging to measure reliably. For example, the length of an object is concrete. On the other hand, a psychological construct like conscientiousness, depression, and self-esteem can be trickier to measure reliably. When assessing studies, evaluate, da evaluate data collection methodologies and consider whether any issues undermine their reliability. Okay, so here's my translation of this. So for example, if you're analyzing a set of data in a research or professional setting, you will need to first clean up, quote unquote, like, like clean up the data set and validate the data set before you can actually perform any data analysis on it. And that could include things like removing irrelevant, duplicate, incomplete, inaccurate data points that might skew your results. Right, like this is an actual procedure that researchers do, right? And it also includes like making sure that the data meets the specific criteria that you set out for your, your, your research study, right? And in my opinion, one of the biggest issues with social media analytics is that your audience or like your follower count is filled with non-ideal clients, right? So think of it like fake accounts or people who follow you just because they know you in person, but they'll never actually buy from you, et cetera, right? So these quote-unquote non-ideal clients who either follow you and are in your audience or they engage with your content, like they like your posts, they, these numbers will therefore skew your data. So let's say like if you get 100 likes from 100 non-ideal clients, a lay person might immediately, they, they might immediately think like, wow, this post is doing so good. I need to do more of this. But if it's a hundred likes from a hundred non-ideal clients who will literally never buy from you, is that even good data, right? Or would, let's say a post that gets five likes from five people who will actually become clients, will that be a better indicator, right? So from a data or research point of view, you want your data to come from ideal clients. But again, the the main problem that a lot of us face is that we don't have the expertise or the skills or even access to the right tools or information to know how to like clean up our social media data, right? So just something to think about. All right, let me read out one final passage from the website. Validity refers to whether measurements reflect what they're supposed to measure. This concept is a broader issue than reliability. Researchers need to consider whether they're measuring what they think they're measuring, or do the measurements reflect something else? 
does the instrument measure what it says it measures? It's a question that addresses the appropriateness of the data rather than whether measurements are repeatable. And validity is a smaller concern for tangible measurements like height and weight. You might have a biased bathroom scale if it tends to be read too high or too low, but it still measures weight. Validity is a bigger concern in social sciences where you can measure elusive concepts like positive outlook and self-esteem. If you're assessing the psychological construct of conscientiousness, you need to confirm that the instrument poses questions that appraises this attribute rather than say obedience. Okay, so my translation here. I would argue that um, things like vanity metrics, like likes and followers do not reflect your business progress or results or success. But on the other hand, um, Maybe metrics like sales, conversion, retention, bounce rate, click-through rate, number of mentions arguably can be more useful. That said, there are still um, like some people who would argue that follower count is a helpful indicator of like brand awareness. So basically, like there's a lot of arguments here and it could go all sorts of ways. So in my personal opinion, the uh, reliability of your social media analytics is kind of the bigger issue rather than the validity of your your analytics just because like someone will argue like LinkedIn analytics are useful and someone will say it's rubbish right so the argument can go both ways and for me I just personally think it's more important to understand whether your data or your numbers or analytics are reliable in the first place so overall the thesis that I'm laying down here is it is questionable and arguable whether or not your social media analytics, whether it be Instagram, LinkedIn, podcast, YouTube, etc., can meet the criteria of being good data because it's just questionable whether it, it, it checks off the criteria of reliability. Okay. And finally, one more discussion I think it is relevant to have when it comes to the limitations of looking at your analytics is that oftentimes we're so fixated on what we can immediately see that we fail to consider what this data actually means and whether it's even a helpful indicator of your progress. And whether it's the immediately visible likes and comments or number of followers or how many reshares you get on your post or the number of impressions you got on your LinkedIn post, like basically anything you can see, right? The numbers you can see. There's also just so much like underlying or like things you just have no access to or like awareness of because it's just not visible. Like for example, you don't know if someone refers you to a friend through word of mouth and you have no idea who forwarded your email to someone else. Or who, who might have shared your podcast episode on their Instagram stories, but they just did not tag you. And because of these things, you, you just have no idea that these things are happening, right? You don't even know who listens to your podcast episode or who saw your LinkedIn post and who really actually liked it and are now checking out your sales page, but they just didn't like physically press the like button, right? There's so much that analytics and metrics just cannot track. It is just not feasible or possible to track that at least like given the current state of technology right so out of sight out of mind out of sight out of your awareness entirely and also like out of sight and you make what is within sight mean all sorts of things and make it really discouraging and like very invalidating about whether things are working or not right so what i really want to offer for today is to remember that more often than not, what is out of sight might actually be a much more helpful indicator of what's working and what's not working. After all, we we already intellectually know that buyers can be really quiet because we're often surprised by who actually reaches out and becomes a client, right? And likewise, many of us have seen how the people who most regularly engage with your content, they never they never work with you. Right. So I'm also sure that you yourself don't often engage with other people's content, even if you've thought about working with them, because I sure as heck really engage with people or message them, even if I have considered working with them. And so many people, they they just won't make themselves visible to you until literally the moment they click the button to book a discovery call with you or straight up message you about working together and 
That's why having a low number of likes or low engagement, it honestly, in my opinion, means nothing about whether people want to buy or not, right? And just to loop back to the earlier point about how different people are, like they have different perspectives on the same set of numbers. One more thing to consider is, are you looking at your numbers in a way that is helpful? Because a lot of times we end up spiraling in a pit of despair every time we look at our analytics and that just isn't helpful to you or your business, especially if the data you're looking at in the first place, it wasn't even a, a, a useful data set in the first place. It's like you, you look at the three likes and make large sweeping statements about that post. For example, maybe you think that the topic just isn't landing or just like some version of it's not working. And if you were already doubting the, the topic or the post, then looking at your numeric data is just going to like amplify the doubt. But it's also like, remember, three likes, that's only three data points. It's just not a large enough data set to draw any coherent conclusions from. So perhaps it's time to rethink how often you're looking at the number of unsubscribes you get from your email list or how many people have dropped off when they were looking at your IG stories. Like you're interpreting this data in ways that just aren't helpful, nor is it accurate, right? You're using it to fuel the belief that things aren't working, right? And thinking that you don't know what you're doing and that you're just not meant for this or cut out for this. You're creating evidence for things not working. But ultimately, your thoughts about your data is going to spill over into how you show up and how you make decisions about your business, your brand, your content, etc. And if it is the case that it is kind of difficult to use your social media analytics to gauge whether someone is even going to work with you, then is it even helpful to ruminate over whether your last post got enough likes or not and how you have so little engagement. So now that we've had a pretty like in-depth discussion about how your analytics may not necessarily be that helpful, the question is then, okay, so what is actually helpful for us as solopreneurs and personal brands and creators to look at? So I personally would suggest putting more emphasis on looking at what ideal clients have actually said to you word for word. And perhaps this could be referred to as qualitative data, right? And this could look like the DM messages or comments from ideal clients and what people have said on your application forms or on the sales call and what clients have actually said to you inside your program. But a note here is Please collect information from people who actually really fit the client that you want to work with. And in my opinion, the most useful qualitative data comes directly from the actual clients you've worked with and who you had a great experience working with and they met the program objectives and got results as opposed to someone who was just in your DMs. But like, even though they look like they're an ideal client, they never actually work with you. So I would argue that the former is a much more accurate source of qualitative data than the latter, okay? So here's what to do. Focus on the exact words that these people have said because it is the information that is most representative of what your ideal clients are thinking, what they're looking for in a coach, the problems they're facing, and so on. So for example, some questions you could ask yourself include what specific pieces of content or messages have really resonated with my clients, right? Or what are things that your clients said that they really could relate to you on? Or what are the, the specific like objections or hesitations or questions that you literally got on your sales call with your client and then later on they became a client, right? And just as an example, I want to share how I'm translating some of my qualitative data from one of our newest members inside the Thought Leader Club into content, okay? So for this awesome individual in particular, they shared with me on the sales call that at this moment, they're just not focused on signing clients, but instead their biggest motivator for joining the Thought Leader Club is to work on their identity as an author and content creator. 
And eventually they might want to offer maybe a coaching program or services, but at least for this round of the Thought Leader Club, they want to work on positioning themselves as an author who is proud of their work and also relaunching their brand, getting support on their content workflow and building up the skill of not doing or writing or saying what other creators in their space are doing, saying, or writing, right? So in an upcoming piece of content, I might consider focusing on how each member of the Thought Leader Club, the, the next cohort, how they all have their own unique set of goals and dreams that they're working towards and how the Thought Leader Club will support them towards their specific goals, right? So for example, I might literally say something like, inside the Thought Leader Club, we will help position you as an incredible author in your niche as you get closer and closer to the launch of your first book. We will also help to ease you back into a regular routine and workflow of content creation and brand building so that number one, documenting your journey uh, and doing content creation becomes second nature. You'll know exactly what you want to talk about. Number two, we'll position your brand correctly from the start so that, for example, even if you add new services or make slight pivots in the future, it won't be like a big overhaul. And number three, you'll develop the skill of creating straight from your brain and your heart without having to like look at what others are doing, saying, or writing. And we'll also set you up for your your, your one year to three year goals, including the launch of your, your book, reestablishing your brand online, including some sort of offers later on, et cetera right? So all of these are points that I could literally include in my content. And let's be honest, I literally just did that, right? Like in this episode, the above points that I just shared, like even though I said like, these are just an example of how you can like use qualitative data and turn it into like content, right? Or like use it as like indicators of what's working or what's like messaging that works or isn't working, right? Like I literally just used it and positioned it as like marketing. Like I just literally used it as marketing in this episode, right? So as you can see, the words that your clients say is a gold mine of content and marketing because not only can you get so much ideas from listening to what your clients are saying, but it is just like, it's just so much more helpful and exciting to look at this qualitative data, right? <laughs> no, but seriously, like I, I know that, um, I know that so far this entire episode has been a little bit more dense than usual because there's a lot of information. And honestly, I know that data, like data information can be really dry, but I just really hope that like this conversation was helpful and allowed you to think about your, your numbers from a different perspective. Okay. So as you start to walk away from this episode, I really just hope that you now have a more helpful understanding of data and then moving forward, you'll be able to focus your time and attention towards the qualitative data that can actually help you grow your business, brand, and body of work. Okay, that is all for us for today. Thank you so, 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 so much for listening to this episode and I'll see you in the next one. Sounds good? Awesome. Let's get to work.